This week on the Catholic Vote Radio Hour. The flag doesn't represent a political regime. It doesn't represent Donald Trump. It represents the values of our country. Why stand for the national anthem? Amber Athey of The Daily Caller explains. The mother gave birth. They posted security guards in her hospital room. They did not let her hold the babies. Catholic Vote President Brian Birch tells of the terrors of the surrogacy industry and the legal case that could help end the nightmare. I'm not even kidding. They're called Nazis for this. They were compared to Hitler oh because they were saying, let's not focus on race. Best-selling author Robert Cruzy explains how sci-fi and political correctness don't mix. In the early days of broadcasting, few people realized what a fine art radio was to become. Hello, you're listening to the Catholic Vote Radio Hour, the only highly rated show that's not overrated. I'm your host, Stephen Harriot. A member of the Communist Party, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? If I had my way about it, they'd all be sent back to Russia or some other unpleasant place. Thank you, Amber Athey, media reporter for The Daily Caller, for joining me now uh, for a quick discussion about the NFL, because we'll never get sick of talking about the NFL and kneeling versus standing during the national anthem, will we? No, we absolutely will not. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, the media is not sick of it, um, considering that was the main takeaway from Trump's uh, press conference with the prime minister of Spain. Even though he talked about, you pointed this out, actually, I saw on Twitter, how, how much did he talk about the NFL? Right. He spent about two minutes on it because of Reuters reporter asked him about it. The rest of the time he talked about Puerto Rico, about Spain, and of course afterwards all of CNN and MSNBC wanted to talk about were his two minutes of comments about the NFL. With the NFL, I think a lot is being lost in the commentary because it's being primarily treated as a First Amendment issue, which I think is silly. I don't think that I think that misses the point because we're talking about whether it's a good idea, let alone allowed, whether you're allowed, whether it's a good idea to do this on primetime TV in a way that is off-putting to audiences. The new polls have come out, by the way, and even African Americans, who ostensibly should be the most on board with this protest, predominantly do not want them to kneel during the national anthem. You're exactly right. One thing that that gets me is I, I think that there are a lot of people with really good intentions who want to view things compassionately, especially in the Christian circles that I move in and that I, that I interact with, who want to see the best intentions behind these protests. People are, for instance, defending it as, well, this is actually patriotic, and protest is, is the ultimate form of patriotism, and they're really trying to just peacefully protest and so forth. But I, then I go back and I think, Colin Kaepernick who is the inspiration behind this Take a Knee movement, he has praised Castro. Mm -hmm. And he has claimed that the United States is is founded on slavery and the uh, genocide of Native Americans. And he says, I refuse to respect the flag of a country that oppresses blacks and so forth. In other words, he didn't even intend it to be a patriotic thing. It's a protest against America itself, in his view. Yeah, that's exactly right. The protest is centered on the fact that America is a fundamentally flawed nation. And I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, this is solely about police brutality. There are things in this country that we can fix. But I think what most Americans recognize is that you can understand that there are things in your country that need to be changed, things that need to be made better, while also still respecting the fundamental institutions, respecting the ideals and values that the country was founded on. And respecting the ideals and values is why people choose to stand and put their hand over the heart for the flag. Like you said, I believe as well that this protest is founded on an anti-American sentiment. The whole idea of kneeling in front of the flag is saying that the flag and the ideas that it represents are not worthy of our respect. And I think that's a deeply flawed element to that protest. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of a lot of sort of social justice activist types who end up becoming anti-Christian because of various injustices they see in the world. And I always want to just grab those people by the lapels and say, but it's by means of citing Christian scripture Mm -hmm. that people were able to abolish slavery. And the whole civil rights movement was based on citing our Western tradition of thought, and particularly Christian thought and the words that we find in our founding documents. Our country wasn't founded on slavery. It was founded on very, very good and noble ideas that we inherited in the Western tradition uh, that have been cultivated throughout our, our history, which in the future after the founding of our country were precisely the means by which we ended up arguing away injustices like slavery. 
Yes, exactly. The whole concept of um, arguing against slavery was founded on the fact that our country was created with the idea that all people were created equal under God. People argued for slavery in this country because they said that black people weren't actually human. It was Christians who said, no, actually they are human. And as we know from our teachings, all humans are equal under God. All humans have rights because of God. Um, and that's what America was founded on. And, you know, without these fundamental values, there would be no argument against slavery. Yeah, and we're extraordinarily lucky to live in a country where those values are enshrined in our founding documents, and we are able to cite those things. There's no recourse to that kind of philosophical groundwork that you can use to defend yourself in places like Cuba. One of the first things Castro did is he rejected uh, the Christian tradition that really is the only thing that stands between oppressors and victims a lot of the time. Yes, and one of the fundamental flaws of government systems like communism and socialism is that they tell um, their people that their rights don't come from God, their rights come from government. Well, if the government gives you your rights, then the government can also take those rights away. And so you don't have rights because you're a human being. You have rights because someone else gave them to you, which is incredibly dangerous, which is why our country is founded on the idea that these rights are fundamental to your human nature. And that's part of what makes America so great that your rights cannot be taken away. Do you think that maybe that's part of why these protesters don't like, for instance, the flag and the anthem? Mm -hmm. Do you think that maybe that anger, that sort of hatred of the nation comes from the fact that they see those things as symbols of a government that can giveth and can taketh away? Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it because a lot of these social justice protesters believe that it is the government's job to grant people rights and then to protect those rights. Of course, we only see the second half of that. The government exists to protect rights that you already have. So if the social justice uh, activists believe that the government isn't properly giving people rights, then it would make sense for them to fundamentally disagree with the entire existence of that government. You know, the proper way to look at the flag and the proper way to look at the national anthem is it's not a celebration of a given regime. It's a celebration of a culture, I think, mm -hmm. of something that isn't even political. We're starting to see everything through a lens of politics. It's like politics is everywhere. And that's one of the biggest complaints um, that the American people are expressing lately in recent polls. Yes, I think it was something like 80% of people who watch NFL games said that they wanted to see less politics in their sports. So if you're talking about the opinion of the people, the NFL protesters are definitely not siding with the majority of the people and certainly not with the majority of their fans. As you brought up earlier, I think one of the other reasons why people are so angry with this protest is because the flag doesn't represent a political regime. It doesn't represent Donald Trump. It represents the values of our country. And so when these people hear Donald Trump come out and say, you know, kneeling is unpatriotic, it's un-American, and then all of a sudden you have entire teams taking a knee or standing arm in arm. It is pretty blatantly an anti-Trump statement. It's no longer about those values that you claim to stand for. For example, when Kaepernick did it, you know, I disagree with why he was doing it, but it seemed to be, I guess, on from good intentions. But now it's become a blatantly anti-Trump thing. And people are saying, well, the flag isn't about Trump. It's about our country as a whole. And you can disagree with certain uh, policy aspects of one administration without desecrating the entire country. Here, here's my main reason why I can't get on board with the whole take a knee thing. I know that these guys are not meaningfully opposed to the worst race issues in our country. They don't sympathize with the sort of mangled, ruined black communities that have been sort of ground into the dirt by cultural decay. Mm -hmm. They do not recognize or sympathize with complaints that you're taking our men away. You've taken marriage away from us, right? Right. You're taking our Christianity away. Blacks are enormously Christian. Mm -hmm. and historically, in fact, Pew Research polls have shown that blacks were the last people, for instance, to accept uh, same-sex marriage. They killed it in California. Remember Proposition 8? Blacks basically struck it down. Mm -hmm. And the left didn't know what to do with that because, I mean, blacks are supposed to be, they're supposed to be obedient leftists. And disproportionately, it's the poor, it's the vulnerable, and it's ethnic minorities who are more likely to be aborted. And uh, he doesn't, Kaepernick won't give him the time of day. Yeah. I mean, they're resisting things that are very fashionable to resist, but are they really meaningfully standing up for the main problems with racism now? I don't think right. so.
Yeah, I don't think so either. It's a very superficial way of looking at the world. And it's something that we see a lot with what we call the social justice warriors, which is that it's always about blaming somebody else or blaming the system. And so they've managed to find what they view as a systemic issue in police brutality. I would disagree that that's even a systemic issue. I think that's more about just individual cops having to be racist or maybe not even having enough training to properly respond to an incident. But they managed to latch on to one, like I said, something they view as a systemic issue, rather than looking inwards at the culture, like you mentioned, or taking responsibility for things that they can do to make their lives better. And that's another great thing about America that these people aren't recognizing is that all of these NFL players were able to have great opportunities in America to achieve and to become some of the richest people in the country. And so for them to kneel in front of the flag and throw up the middle finger to the country that has given them so many opportunities is incredibly disappointing to people and it makes them look like hypocrites. And um, especially considering not only were many of these people able to overcome poverty or overcome cultural issues in their societies to become wealthy and become successful, but some of them grew up really privileged. Some of them grew up with stable families that were, you know, middle income, high income families. Many of them went to private school, were able to attend elite universities where they played football for a living. So it's hard for people to square that with the fact that they're now lecturing many football fans who are working class Americans who really haven't achieved that level of success. I just think to myself, are you really are you really sincere here? Prove it to me. The fact, first of all, Colin Kaepernick, that you sympathize with murderous ideologies. You're trying to compare America to Cuba and say that Fidel Castro did a better job than the U.S. with helping the poor. That makes me think you're scary, dude. Yeah, well, that's a, your politics is yeah, scary. That's I mean, especially this concerning stuff is, because this is evil. Now people are, as we start started off this discussion framing this as a First Amendment issue, um, saying people have the right to kneel. In this country, yes, they do have the right. In Cuba, they do not. People are jailed for handing out political pamphlets all the time there. So for them to criticize the United States' capacity for free speech while supporting communism is absurd. <laughs> I am criticizing the lack of freedom in America. In the name of communism, please make us more free. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. It's funny, but sad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Amber Athey. Your commentary is terrific, by the way, and I follow you on Twitter and often retweet you. And I'd like our listeners to be able to do the same thing. Where can we find you online? Yes, you can find me at Amber underscore Athey on Twitter. And I also have a YouTube account where you can watch my TV appearances. We will have you on again very soon. And also, uh, Amber has recently joined as a Catholic Vote columnist. You'll see her uh, columns, opinion pieces occasionally on CatholicVote.org. All right, thank you for being with us, Amber. All right, thanks so much. All right, joining me now is Catholic Vote President Brian Birch, who has uh, some alarming commentary on a new case having to do with surrogacy that is reaching the Supreme Court very soon. The case is called MC versus CM, and it is frightening, isn't it? Oh, that's probably an understatement of the week. Uh, you're absolutely right. This case was conferenced by the Supreme Court this, this last Monday, so September the 25th. That means the justices came together, they reviewed the case, and we expect them to announce uh, within the next several weeks whether or not they will take up formally, which in legal terms is, is called granting certiorari, where the court will actually uh, hear the case next fall. Now, what is your involvement? Because Catholic Vote has had a hand in drawing attention to this. That's exactly right. A lot of people don't realize is that Catholic Vote is a multi-pronged advocacy organization. So in addition to our grassroots mobilization, our electoral politicking, uh, we also have a legal arm. And what that legal arm does is it provides grants to attorneys in cases that we believe are consistent with our mission. And in this particular case, we retained lawyers out of New Jersey, a private law firm, to prosecute a case on behalf of a mother, a surrogate mother in California, who was paid via a surrogacy contract, became pregnant with triplets. The surrogate buyer was out of Georgia. He demanded that one of the triplets be aborted. She refused. We came in, protected her rights, protected the child from being aborted, and are now engaged in a very uh, lengthy lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of surrogacy laws themselves. 
Well, and yes, it is a much broader issue than just this one mother, but hearing her story and then realizing that it's not an uncommon story, that's what horrifies me. Can you give me some details about her case? This is absolutely horrendous, but in the United States, a person, any private party can enter into a private contract for a child. Now, in this case, the mother became pregnant with triplets. She eventually gave birth to those triplets. The, the facts about the birth it itself uh, are, are almost beyond description. Hmm. The mother uh, gave birth. They posted security guards in her hospital room. They did not let her hold the babies. They did not let her nurse the babies. They immediately took them away from her. She asked how they were doing. They said, that's none of your business. She is treated as a breeder. Uh, in order to bring about the children for the surrogate buyer. Uh, we explained to the court that the mother had an interest in the well-being of the children. And she had a specific interest in the well-being of children because she found out that the buyer of these children, previously unknown to her, is a 50-year-old deaf postal worker who lives in the basement of his parents' home. Oh. He cannot speak. He cannot hear. Uh, his parents are handicapped. They do not want the children in their home. Uh, recent filings that we presented to the court show that there is uh, a heroin addict nephew that lives in the home. Oh. The father chain smokes and the mother is so handicapped she cannot get out of bed. So you can imagine now you're going to place three vulnerable, innocent triplets in this home uh, and, and imagine what type of environment this will be. Uh, we presented these facts to the court. And the judge in the case in California said it is of no interest to this court about what will happen with these children. That is appalling. So since this case has sort of come to light, has anyone gone to the home of the uh, of the of the adopter and looked at the conditions that the children are living in? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, in fact, the children were eventually delivered to the buyer, uh, CM, in Georgia by the hospital in California. And what we've learned since the children have been there both in a recent affidavit filed with the court, as well as information available to us uh, uh, on the ground, is that the children are in a, a horrible situation. Uh, some of the facts, as we know, just recently disclosed to the court, uh, the children, when they first arrived, he was not able to feed them properly, and they were taken to the emergency room. He does not change their diapers regularly. They've developed severe rashes and have had to go to the emergency room. Oh. Uh, in some cases, uh, report reports from his own sister suggest that he is having them eat off of the dirty floor. Oh. Uh, and he himself is, is, is a handicapped individual. He is prone to violence. Uh, he has killed several family pets. Uh, he's pulled out all of his hair, he has oh. anger problems, and he, and he leaves the house often with the babies unattended. So th this is a, is a extraordinarily tragic uh, situation for these children, and, and they need our assistance. This issue of service Surrogacy itself is something that I don't think a lot of people are paying a lot of attention to. Surrogacy is largely outlawed in Europe. It's only in the United States where it's the kind of wild west of baby making. And regrettably, as a result of the sexual revolution and the disintegration of marriage, we are racing towards a new kind of brave new world of creating, selecting, purchasing children where really we are turning children into commodities to be bought and sold in the free market. Uh, we referenced just the other day the idea that it probably is not too far off that certainly some people are planning that someday people will buy a baby on Amazon. Mm. I mean, that's really where our culture is headed and why we need to establish the legal framework and legal protections for children and mothers to make sure that this doesn't happen. What's being forgotten here, I think, is just another example of there's a human person involved here, and there are not only God-given, but constitutional rights that are being violated. Isn't that what is being argued in this case? It is. It's precisely it. One of the issues that our case raises is the constitutional rights of the mother and the mother's fundamental relationship with her child. And the lawyers tell me, I'm not actually an attorney, so, uh, but our, our lawyers help explain that one of the most fundamental rights recognized in our laws today is a mother's relationship with her child. Uh, this is very obvious in the adoption context, for example. We don't just allow someone to walk in and sign a paper and hand over the baby a couple of minutes later. 
Uh, it's a long process. It allows the birth mother a period to reflect on her decision and it allows her a period to revoke that decision uh, should she decide that that was not uh, what she wanted for her child. But of course, in some of the uh, brave new world context, whether it's surrogacy or abortion, we pretend that that bond no longer exists and we do not protect the rights and interests of mothers and we rip their ch children away from them and we tell them they are nothing but breeders to be used for our mm. own private uh, economic interests. Right, because we're progressive and we care about women, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's one of the real sad tragedies of the sexual revolution is the ways in which women have become commodified, where they're used and abused by uh, both commercially and culturally, uh, and they become kind of the the tools of, of society, obviously men, to do with as we please. Uh, when we want a child, we can purchase one and use them for this or that purpose. But when they become uh, no longer useful to us, they can be discarded. Their emotions should need to be suppressed or medicated away, and they should uh, go back into the shadows until we, till we decide we want to use them again. Well, what is next? What, what, we, what should we be looking for in the future? Where's this case headed? Well, as in all things legal, uh, sometimes things take a lot of time. So we have appealed this case to the United States Supreme Court, the, at least the lawsuit out of California. The court has conferenced on that, and we'll, we expect to hear from them very soon whether or not they will take this case uh, and address the question of the constitutionality of surrogacy in California. Uh, we have a separate lawsuit. Uh, in Georgia involving these the, these children. Uh, we are pursuing that, and if we are denied by the court in this first try, we will come back uh, to the Supreme Court uh, with the Georgia case. And we have other things we're working on. The point being is that we will not uh, cease in our efforts to end surrogacy in America and to protect the real rights and interests of mother in this, mothers in this country. Well, thank you, Brian. This has been a brief conversation with Brian Birch, the president of Catholic Vote and the overlord of the Catholic Vote Radio Hour. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it's time for our weekly political discussion with Catholic Vote political director Joshua Mercer. Joshua Mercer, we have a sad week that we're getting through, and let's slog through it along with our very sympathetic listeners. First of all, health care fail. What happened with Graham Cassidy? Well, I mean, there was not a single Democrat willing to offer a vote to try to mm -hmm. replace and reform Obamacare. It's Everyone knows it's failing, and the Democrats didn't want to come to the table with it because this is Obama's legacy. Right. So you were dealt with a situation where only 52 Senate Republicans, they had to come up with a plan that pretty much everyone would agree on. All it would take is three Republicans to say, I don't like this plan, and all the wheels would come off the wagon and it wouldn't get done. All right, let's name and shame. Who were those three? <laughs> well, first of all, you're dealing with a very big problem because Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins are two pro-abortion Republicans. They're the only two Senate Republicans who are pro-abortion. But like I said, you only need three to take this bill out, right? And so right then and there, you're starting, because this bill is very pro-life, then and there you start with two potential no votes. And that made it really tough. So when John McCain came out in July and said, I don't want to vote for the skinny repeal, everyone went back to the drawing board. And that this is what they came up with, Cassidy-Graham bill, which basically said, look, Let's get rid of the individual mandate, forcing people to have to buy health insurance. A lot of these are actually working class people who can't afford to buy health care, so they get a fine. Let's get rid of the employer mandate, which makes it really difficult for businesses to hire. They basically hire a lot of part-time people because they want to make them full-time and have to do the health care insurance. So uh, there would be a lot of other things. It would eliminate taxes on medical devices. It would reduce taxes on health savings accounts. It would expand health savings accounts. There's a lot of great reforms in this bill. Essentially, it would take the funding mechanism of Obamacare and send it to the states. So if you live in a blue state and you love Obamacare, you could basically make your own California Obamacare fine. But the red states who don't like it, they could say, let's try something new. Let's try a little bit more experimentation. You would have a lot more flexibility in how you deliver health care insurance. And I think ultimately you would see a lot better reform, including on Medicaid. Now, I love our Catholic bishops and they are very good stewards, but they had a big problem with the Medicaid caps in this bill. A lot of you listeners probably don't understand how Medicaid works. There is no cap. So there is no maximum amount. There's no like, okay, well, we can't spend more than this much money. You know, we have to budget X amount. It's open-ended. Whatever people 
and their needs come to Medicaid, Medicaid writes that check and pays it no matter what. Okay, now that is a little bit dangerous because you're running into this point where a lot of baby boomers are retiring and the spending on it goes up and up every year. So one of the things that they've done is they said, let's let states have some waivers. And Rhode Island, a very liberal blue state, and Indiana, a conservative red state, asked for permission to try to redo their Medicaid program. This sounds kind of boring, but it's important because here's what happened. Both these states, even the liberal state and the conservative state, saved a lot of money. Why? Because they know the people in their state better and it's you don't have this massive federal government. And so they spent less money. They helped more people. And you know what? We can do the same thing nationwide. Let all these other states try this. Right. Why aren't we? It seems like by now, Republicans should have Democrats backed against a wall, especially with regard to Obamacare. It's failed. It's embarrassing. And uh, of course, with the scandals uh, surrounding uh, Planned Parenthood and the, the, the growing popular demand for it to be defunded, uh, it seems like we would have the upper hand there as well. So what is the excuse <laughs> for this not happening? Right. Well, I mean, obviously part of the problem, like I said, is you have uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, very liberal pro-abortion senators that make it difficult. And then John McCain. My biggest beef fundamentally is still with John McCain. Here's the thing. Some of these things have been debated for months and months anyway, but he wants what's called regular order. He wants it to go into the committees and to debate it and have the amendments on it, which is all well and good. But if he made this point in February, I sure as heck didn't hear it. It doesn't seem to me to be a really good thing way to torpedo the entire effort. And the fact of the matter is what they try to do with the skinny repeal, which is the version right before this, I mean, how much more would you need to debate this? We've been talking about repealing Obamacare for seven years, and the skinny repeal would just basically say, we're going to defund Planned Parenthood. We've been trying to do that for four or five years anyway. We're going to get rid of the employer and the individual mandates. I mean, we've been talking about that. We went to the Supreme Court to get rid of those things. So like, in some ways, you know, I understand what he means, like make sure you have an open process and stuff like that. But we have been open with the American people. It seems like it seems like McCain was open with the American people when he said, "I'm going to lead the fight to do, <laughs> to get rid of Obamacare." Stop Obamacare. Yeah. What happened? Well, that's exactly what he said. He said that in his United States Senate campaign just last year. Right. So, he was facing a tough primary challenge and John McCain transforms into a conservative every time someone tries to challenge him in the primary. And then once he gets that primary locked up, he swings far to the left and becomes a very liberal Republican. And so, you know, it was very unfortunate. I mean, we had the opportunity to really provide a lot of relief for American people, a lot of hardworking Catholic families who have suffered through years and years of premium rate hikes yeah. from their insurance companies. The number of people who are even offering health insurance keeps dwindling lower and lower. And you can't can't help but wonder if all of this is going according to plan. This was like a quote unquote conspiracy theory. Five, six years ago, conservatives said you are designing Obamacare to intentionally fail so that five, six, seven, ten years later, you'll get socialist health care. And I think that's exactly what Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer want to do. They want to have in 2020, they want a Democratic House a Democratic Senate send single payer socialist health care to the desk of a Democratic president. I think right. that's the that is I think scary. that's been the game plan from all along. That is really scary because for one thing, I mean, just if you're not even very involved in politics, but you have a conscience, that's scary because of first of all the attack on individual well, liberties, right? Obviously there's that. And in fact, just imagine what it would do for the unborn and the elderly. Well, that's exactly what I'm thinking. You know? And what it would do for the unborn and the elderly and what it would do in general. You know what the sad thing also about a lot of this stuff is there's so much covering up going on. The sad stories, the stories of people who have suffered as a result of Obamacare are being covered up, even by some Catholics and some Christians. And it's very sad to me. So like over the past few years, I haven't had a huge income. And, you know, my wife and I actually opted for a third party Catholic health share. And right. it's a big expense uh, in comparison to if we were to just go fully on the dole. And those stories are everywhere. And I think many of our listeners probably have that story. Well, I mean, I would say our listeners, if you haven't looked into it, my family as well, we were on a health share style account, uh, whether it's Samaritan or CMF Cure or Catholic Solidarity. There's lots of these different Christian-based health share accounts. They were able to get an exemption inside of the Obamacare law so that any money you put into these health share accounts, it's not considered insurance. Therefore, you're not paying for someone else's abortion. Right. You know, you're not paying for someone else's sterilization. And what's nice, you, you know, you're, you're dealing with a community of like-minded people who, and you're all kind of sharing in the costs. And uh, it's a lot cheaper than just going yep. out on an individual market. And we're not getting any, we're not getting any money for saying this. We, we're just saying this because we really believe. Yeah, it. no, absolutely. My wife and I 
I um, actually also just got a little no- nice little note from Solidarity HealthShare. Hey, you paid for Dan this month or last month. And my wife sent, sent yeah. him a little note saying we're praying for you. And it was just like, this is so cool. And why is this disparaged? Why is this uh, uh, demonized? Is like these actually? It sounds exactly sort of like what the Catholic left would want healthcare to be like. I mean, you're talking about getting rid of a lot of the bureaucracy and the middleman, and you're connecting people like you and I to helping someone else who's in need directly. I mean, it's a much more humane system. I think it's great. Now, actually, so Catholic vote political director. What do you recommend we do? Should we just get very angry and tune out and stop paying attention to politics because the swamp hasn't been drained? And <laughs> maybe just turn oh, back well, later when. I mean, look. What do we do? Like Ben Franklin said, if someone asked Ben Franklin, what did you do? You know, what have you wrought? He said, a republic, if you can keep it. And I make that same point. Like, we have these times of failure. The other side has failures too, by the way. Don't forget that. But yes, there are times where we stumble and we fail and we got to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and keep fighting. We got to keep keep fighting and otherwise we're never going to win. Amen. And the first step is to stay informed by going to the loop, which Josh is the editor of. So Josh, tell us, how do we stay in the loop? Just go to catholicvote.org slash loop and sign up for our free daily email newsletter. You can get through it really quickly, three to five minutes. It's a lot of fun, a lot of interesting articles, and uh, we, we try to keep it a little light too. So you should enjoy it. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll talk to you next week. All right. Take care. Now it's time for a conversation with one of my favorite authors. Robert Cruzy is a best selling science fiction author. On top of being a sci fi writer, he's also a wrong thinker. Mm-hmm. And you've gone out of your way to get right into the crosshairs of the sort of intolerant intelligentsia, which you see as existing in the science fiction world every bit as much as it exists in Hollywood. And that's scary to me because especially when we think about science fiction classics, the dystopian classics of the 20th century that warned against repressive, purified regimes— it's it's supposed to be a freedom loving genre, right? Yeah, and and a genre that should be uh, suited for lots of different viewpoints and different ways of looking at things and um, different ide- ideologies. And you know, it was never never restricted by one particular viewpoint. That's kind of the whole point that you're that anything can happen. You can you can kind of explore different ideologies from different perspectives and. It's really bad. Um, in fact, I mean, I, I I don't have a lot of firsthand experience, or really any, with with Hollywood. Um, but in some ways, I would I think it's probably worse with sci-fi because it's a smaller, more insular insular kind of world, and so it's sort of uh, incestuous to use that uh, use a, a a kind of a hot term, uh, sort of group think um, kind of echo chamber reinforcement of of progressive ideology that goes on, and it's not that there's any kind of conspiracy it's just that a really large proportion of people in sci-fi and and this is true in literature and fiction um, circles uh, in general they're very liberal very progressive and that's you know that's okay in itself but it leads to this sort of uh, marginalization of other voices and kind of a repression of other viewpoints which is it's just it's not healthy for the genre it's not good for readers it's not good for the for writers to not be exposed to different viewpoints and to always be you know confirmed in their own point of view all the time um so yeah it's i and um you know there and there are quite a few other people like me i'm i'm definitely not the first or the loudest or most uh, well known um of the people speaking out against this but there are, there are several others who are just who have gotten just sick of it because it's not the way it's not the way things should be and it's like I and other authors sort of dreamed of being you know this is this is my dream I wanted to be a sci-fi author since you know as long as I remembered I, I just dreamed of seeing my books on the shelves next to you know Harry Harrison and Roger Zelazny and all these um, these guys that I read gr- growing up and then I kind of and now I'm sort of part of this club but I'm kind of ostracized and, you know, and I can't, there are certain things that I can't say and I can't do without getting on the wrong side of people. And it's just, it sucks. So how did you actually, tell me about that. You mentioned your childhood. You mentioned wanting to write sci-fi from early childhood. How did you start off? What, what got you into this very, very initially? Like start as early, start with you as a fetus. As a, as a fetus, we're going. We're taking, this is a uh, this is a pro life show. So we're we're, we're right. going all the way back to my uh, my formative uh, 
months right, in the womb. Informative nine months. What were you thinking? Yeah. Well, I was thinking. Go ahead. I wanted to get out. I was. I felt <laughs> confined. Um, huh. Obviously, for people my age, I'm 47. Is that right? 47. Yeah. So I don't know, um, Robert. So, <laughs> I can't. I can't look to you <laughs> for help on this. No. Uh, I got to keep track of some of these things myself. This is why I need an assistant. Uh, 47 <laughs> now, and so I was um, seven years old when Star Wars came out, and so I was just old enough to kind of be able to sort of remember what life was like before Star Wars. But then, it, like I sort of grew up with this huge explosion of like sci-fi. Um, mm. space opera fantasy and it was just so amazing to me and people of my age it was really a very formative thing to have star wars come out and then it was it just kind of took over our lives because we had the star wars figures and the star wars cards it was the first of these gigantic blockbusters and it just cut it sort of mm. like took over our lives for like a few years there where like everybody was into star wars and it was like the coolest thing ever and we saw it you know 10 times and in the theater and stuff right. And so that was the first big thing that was, you know, formative for me and a lot of other people. Um, then the mm-hmm. other ones were Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. These very sort of wry, irreverent British humor with taking sort of right. sci-fi tropes and just sort of poking fun at them. Those made a definite impression on me. Right. And I thought, now, now, I would love to do something like that, you know? Right. So you, you've talked a lot about the works that influenced you, you know, the Star Wars phenomenon and so forth. The works that influenced you. What about in your personal life? What formed your voice, do you think? I mean, uh, you've written even elsewhere a little bit about uh, about your childhood, about being in school and kind of becoming sort of by nature a libertarian. And, and you're Christian and you're pro-life. But aside from even politics, your personality kind of comes out in your writing in that way. Yeah, I've always been um, nonconformist, uh, idiosyncratic. I never liked being told what to do. That was always a problem um, growing up in school, um, and I, I always I would question everything. You know, uh, I'd be told to do something, and I, and I never. The fact that I was being told to do it was not in itself a good enough reason for me to do it, and so I often would just not do the thing I was supposed to do just to see what would happen. Uh, is there really a reason for this? You know. So, yeah, and I don't know really where that comes from. Um, it, it feels almost like a genetic thing to me where I'm, I'm very uh, aware of not going with the flow just because that's the way things are going. And then, yeah, it, it helps to have a, a painful childhood. <laughs> It does. <laughs> to not to never fit in anywhere to be I highly recommend it. Yeah. If you're gonna be I was on a panel once where they asked, How do you write humor? Several other people gave their answers and I said, Well it, what you should, first off you should have a painful childhood, which people you know, is not <laughs> isn't particularly helpful. Huh. Um but it's true because you you end up having sort of as a child, you know, you don't really have any control over your world and if you feel like you don't fit in, you feel like you're always, you know, not a victim, but just sort of being pushed around nothing makes sense to you right. um, especially if you have kind of a, a weird brain like I do and like you have a hard time in school because you can't do the stuff that the other kid you can do some things really well but other things are just a mystery for you it's a very confusing and frustrating and you develop a sort of a twisted sense of humor about it because it's a defense mechanism hmm. so later on that comes in handy if you're trying to write novels yeah well so you say your brain worked differently you had a weird brain is that the way you put it yeah, I have a weird brain. What do you mean you had a weird brain? I'm an introvert in very much the kind of classic psychological sense where there's so much right. stuff going on that I often don't realize there's an outside world as well. Just things like like simple tasks w- would elude me. Like I would be I, I was really smart and would test like five grade levels ahead. Um on, on reading and writing and stuff and, and uh, you know, like doing like college level stuff when I was in fifth grade or whatever. So it was like, okay, everything should be easy for me, right? Because I'm like super smart. Um, but then I would just be baffled by the simplest things like, this is a little bit later on, but this is a good example of this. I got a job once loading trucks. There were packages of all different sizes and I had to, my job was as these packages came down the assembly line, I was supposed to load them into the truck. I compare it to playing Tetris in 3D, where you have to take these things and go, okay, it fits here. This one fits next to it. This one goes on top of it. And you had to do it about that fast, um, one every few seconds, you know. And then if you if you stacked them up in a way that wasn't sustainable, they, it would all collapse. 
or you would have big gaps at the top of the truck that you couldn't get to. Uh, and then somebody would have to come over and grumble and say, what, you know, what, what are you doing? And this was like the yeah. simplest job in the world. You know, I was loading trucks and I couldn't do it because I don't know what, because I couldn't picture the stuff in my head because there was too much other stuff going on in my head. That sort of scenario repeated itself over and over throughout my childhood right. where it was like, why can't I do this? And of course, my parents and my teachers and everybody would be like, you're smart, Rob. Why can't you do this? And I would say, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I really don't know. Yeah, no, I know the feeling. I've done some a fair amount of blue collar work and it's very humbling because I am profoundly stupid. When I'm around people who do that kind of work for some reason, yeah. I mean, so I feel you. Yeah, construction I you. work. I mean, I've done all sorts of different things. You know, I, I delivered pizzas for a while and I was bad at that because I have no sense of direction. Right. I'm curious, how did you transition into, I mean, you have a very unusual career. Not everyone gets to write books for a living. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, I took the, the usual path of becoming a philosophy major uh, and then getting out of college and I looked to the in the classified ads and there was like no, there weren't any like openings for philosophers, which was kind of a <laughs> shock to me. I, I was like, okay, well, computers, this was like 1990, well, I graduated in 92, so I was like early, I worked at Blockbuster for a little while and, and other, you know, things that I was terrible at, delivering pizzas and stuff. Delivering pizzas, yeah. That's a cool job. I've done that, yeah. It would be cool if, if you had a sense of direction. Now it would be easier because you use GPS, but back then... It, it is. Was... I'm, a little, I'm a little younger than you, but man alive, am I lucky there's GPS. Oh. Or, I mean, I, I could not have... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was bad. And again, I was like, I had problems with authority and stuff, and so I would be like, I, I'd be in the pizza place and there'd be nothing to do because it was kind of slow, and then I'd get yelled at because I was standing around when I could be wiping the tables or something and the tables are already clean but the point is that you're supposed to look busy and that just rubbed me wrong and so I was like you know screw that I'm leaving <laughs> because I'm not I'm not it's like it's against my principles to wipe a table that's already clean well you know, like <laughs> so it's, it's a good it's a good thing you're you're self-employed Rob I don't uh, think <laughs> yeah my boss is still a jerk but now I, I can't really complain about it because he's me right um, what was I talking about? <laughs> All right, go I, ahead. But I literally don't remember what I was talking Let's about. Let's actually though. the pizza delivery thing, and then oh no, what I was a philosophy major, and then I was like doing all these crappy jobs and I was like, you know what? I need to get into like a field that's in demand. So I thought I'm going to teach myself about computers, and I did. Um, ended up moving to California and got a job doing tech support, worked my way into doing technical writing and website design, moved from that into computer programming and database development, actually worked for a couple of big companies. I worked for Google and a few other places in the Bay Area for a few years. Uh, and then I wrote, an, I'd always wanted to write a novel, so kind of in my spare time, I wrote Mercury Falls, and it took off, and I wrote a few more books, and they, were, they did all right, and I thought, I could probably do this for a living. So I left the software thing and then started writing. That's amazing. That's really cool. I mean, I think a lot of people just don't have the guts to do that. Well, yeah, guts or just, I was kind of in denial about the consequences of these things, you know, like I would just be like, why not? You know, I'm just going to do this. I was more, I was, I always had to keep moving and do something, you know, so it's just sort of a, I don't know if it's guts so much as just like not knowing my limitations and being inherently unrealistic about things, like being overly optimistic about my chances of of success. Yeah. So I had some, you know, so you have some failures because you think, oh yeah, this should be no problem. And then it turns out it's way harder than you thought, but you keep at it and, uh, you know, you keep moving and eventually something clicks. Right. So tell me about the industry you're in now and your project really, I mean, not your whole only project, you actually write quality fiction. And that's one of your main points is that you, you don't want people to do the lazy thing by writing social justice related advocacy thinly veiled as novels. Yeah. And, and there's a tendency for that to happen. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I heard about the new Star Trek. It's going to address the issues of the Trump era. And, you know, every fan of Star Trek almost is going to say, you know, kind of groan and say, oh my gosh, so I, I wanted, you know, I want science fiction, yeah. not political commentary. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, there is, in defense of that sort of things, I mean, there there was some of that sort of heavy-handed political commentary in the original Star Trek. That's true, actually, yeah. You know, that, and, that, and that's fine. Heavy-handed or lighter-handed political commentary, you know, I mean, that's part of the tradition of sci-fi, the problem is when you have one viewpoint that is the correct one, and everybody has to, you know, their, mm. their fiction has to push that point of view, um, and, the, and other point of views are marginalized or disallowed. 
Um, you know, if somebody wants to write message fiction, however that's defined, that's fine. If people want to buy that stuff, that's great. Um, I don't have any problem with that. If people want to write a book promoting mm-hmm. communism or whatever, go ahead. You know, I mean, I think it's going to be a ridiculous book because it's <laughs> you can't really promote communism and do it in a uh, an honest fashion. Or a fun fashion. Or a fun Your fashion, yeah. Funny. I mean, it's probably going to be a t- ter- – one way or another, it's going to be a terrible book. But, you know, if people Yay, want mass to graves. read it or write it, go, yeah, go, ahead and, go ahead and do it. But if it's like, you know, anything where, where somebody speaks up from a sort of more of a conservative or libertarian perspective, then it's it's like, well, you know, we can't, we can't do that. So what makes you, as you've called yourself, a wrong thinker, borrowing a phrase from Orwell in this industry? Honestly, it's just that. We can get into my specific views about, you know, being – fairly conservative and, and libertarian and stuff, which is all wrong too, of course, because you know, I, I don't fit in. Right. But it's enough just to be critical of the industry and say, look, we should focus on, like the Hugo Awards, should focus on finding the best science fiction rather than, say, focus on the race or the sexual orientation, the political oppressed status of the author. We should focus on the fiction and make sure that we're rewarding the best fiction that's out there. Right. That's a controversial statement. There was this whole thing with the Hugo Awards, which are the predominant sci-fi awards, or at least were. They've become sort of the social justice awards, where people are being rewarded because they say the right things, they write about the right things, they're black, they're a lesbian, they're Hispanic, they're whatever, some marginalized group. And so it's like, oh, well, we, you know, we want to support those people. And, and it's like, fine, support those people. But if you're giving out an award... You look at the fiction, the book, right. the outcome, the quality. the quality of the book or the story or, or the movie or whatever. You don't, you know, and that's it's very, it should be egalitarian in that sense where you're looking at quality. And have they done something original? Have they done something smart, entertaining, fun, thought provoking? Look at that stuff. And just saying that is, is, that's essentially what the Sad Puppies group said. And they were, I'm not even kidding, they're called Nazis for this. They were compared to Hitler oh because they were saying, let's not focus on race. Let's not focus on sexual right. orientation. Let's focus on the quality of the work. You know what's funny to me, what what I've been thinking, at least before 2016 and the whole sort of upset of 2016, I mean, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I've watched every generation of Star Trek. I enjoy it. And it's basically socialist propaganda. Yeah. And similarly, many of us are big fans of, say, Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is very noticeably tinged with progressive ideology. So it's interesting to me that when when the roles were reversed, I've not heard a lot of complaint from just sort of average Joes. By the way, average Joes tend to be a little bit more conservative. Many of us are big fans of Star Trek, which is pretty, you know, left-leaning. And we're also big fans of SNL and things like that. We tolerate it insofar as we find it enjoyable and well-written and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it seems like that sort of deference is not paid in kind from from the left. There's a lot more like, I will not read this book because all the characters are white. Right. That's strange to me. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's definitely true. I mean, there's people will say that conservatives do the same thing, but really they don't. Because if you look at popular entertainment over the past 20, 30, 40 years, Everything coming out of Hollywood and most fiction, you know, novels and books and anything on television, the vast majority of it leans toward the left, toward the liberal progressive side. And you don't hear about people saying, conservatives saying, well, I'm not going to watch this show because it has, I mean, yes, it happens once in a while. It happens. But this is like all of media. If conservatives were to avoid leftist, left-leaning media, they would have to just get rid of their television and get, you know, not go see any movies because there's so much of it out there. Mm-hmm. So it's much easier, I think, for someone of the the left-leaning perspective to sort of live in an echo chamber, especially if you're if you're like a, an author who's living in New York who's a liberal or, you know, in Seattle or something, you can go basically your whole life without being exposed to a conservative viewpoint of any of any kind. <clears throat> Whereas if you're a conservative living in Iowa or something, it's coming over your TV. It's coming through the bookstores, the newspapers, the magazines, the movie studios. It's all coming at you. Right. So it's it's and so then when that when this stuff permeates that bubble in New York 
or or Los Angeles or San Francisco or wherever, mm -hmm. there's a much more violent reaction from the left where it's like we have to shut right. this down. Something is horribly wrong. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah know? you know, and I do I do think it is provincialism, and they and, they, mm -hmm. it's, and they, it it actually yeah. comes from in some cases I feel kind of bad because sometimes it's really just shocked that such things exist. It's seriously just it's not just recoiling because how dare you? It's I've never seen one of you before. Yeah, and uh, as I forget who originally made this joke, but they see you and they say I thought you people had horns. <laughs> <laughs> right. How, how dare you infiltrate like this into the human race? Yeah. You're, you, I think that's a very true insight. One last thought I wanted to go over with you a little bit. Listeners should know your work is not ideological. And yet, when I read it, I sense a little bit of something in it that is, I would put it this way I would say it's merely reverent toward human nature. There, there are a few books where I, where I toyed with slightly more overt political themes, but yeah, for the most part, I try to be true to my understanding of what human beings are and what's great about being human and what's great about being in this universe or what's confusing about being in, or painful about being in this universe, you know, which again comes back to what you're saying, which is that we're all, we're all individuals and we have this we have this weird, there's this kind of a strain about uh, free will that runs through a lot, a lot of my books and sort of being this kind of point of consciousness in this big confusing place um, and trying to make sense of, of it all. Um, so yeah, I'm very much an individualist and very much focused on what it means to be that point of consciousness in this place. And a lot of times I deal with it in humorous ways. It's not all as, you know, like super, I mean, well, very little of it is actually is super serious. It's a lot of it is, is just jokes and stuff. But behind that, um, yeah, that's where a lot of it comes from is just kind of the absurdity of the individual human existence and the wonderfulness and the, and the horribleness and the absurdity right. of it. Well, you're a very accomplished writer, by the way. I should mention to the readers, Robert has written uh, roughly 430 books. Yeah. And... <laughs> Which are the first? No, it's something like something like fifteen, I, but you can't remember. Yeah, I can. I never, I never have a firm number because I'm always like working on two of them, and then like you right. know some of them. So it's, I think it's, it's about fifteen at this point that are actually out. Right. So okay, so fifteen. I slightly overshot. Yeah, a but, little bit. I'll get there. What are, the, what are the first? What are the first two or three books that you would recommend readers check out? Probably Mercury Falls is th that was my first novel, and it's probably just the craziest and one that people enjoy the most. And that one deals with some religious themes and stuff, but in sort of a, a lighthearted way. So Mercury Falls. And the other one that I think is my funniest series, I'm working on this, this series that started with Starship Grifters, which is not at all serious. And it's sort of a madcap Mel Brooks, Woody Allen-ish kind of uh, craziness in space um, kind yeah. of thing, which is a throwback to my Douglas Adams, uh, Harry Harrison days. It's just pure fun. So right. those, are, those are, if you want something lighter and just wacky and fun, those are the Starship Grifters. Starship Grifters is the first book. There's a sequel and a prequel, and I'll be working on more of those because people like them. So. Right. I'm going to recommend that people also follow you on Twitter, at Rob Cruzy, which is at R-O-B-K-R-O-E-S-E, -E, correct? Correct. All right. So I'm going to tell people to follow that and also check out these books. They're invigorating, and it also feels good to be reading a book knowing that the guy that wrote them is, is a guy who doesn't want necessarily to attack you for your beliefs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Necessarily, right? <laughs> or if he, does, I might want to attack you, but he might want to. Yeah, after a few drinks, maybe if you push him. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with me, Rob. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, that's all for this week. You've been listening to the Catholic Vote Radio Hour, the show you've been waiting for all your life. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. See you next week.